All right, guys, we're back for uh, another edition of Talking Press. We're heading into week 10. Is that right, Alex? It's week 10. Week 10. All right, we're going to talk about high school rankings. I want to throw it right to the guru. Every week I hear about this ranking's right, or I'm ranked higher in this ranking than that ranking, and what ranking is right. Me, personally, I think the guru's rankings are right. But how do you do it, and, and how do you deal with everybody who always says, well, I'm ranked higher in that one, so I'll be ranked higher in yours? Well, it's an inexact science. I'll say that, and, you know, I've been ranking every team in the state, you know, to come up with the Carolina preps top 25s or the top, the sweet 16 to the Charlotte observer top tens and Raleigh news and observer top tens. I go through every team in the state, every Friday night into Saturday, sometimes into Sunday. It's a grueling process that usually involves about 12 to 15 hours of looking at huddle clips and, you know, getting on the phone and text messaging coaches and, you know, finding out the ins and outs. And a lot of it is very, you know, here and now with what's going on uh, in the 2023 season or whatever the current season may be. But, you know, a lot of it also is the fact that, you know, I've been around this game my entire life, essentially. You know, I know I've been going to games since, you know, the late, late 70s and, you know, growing up on sidelines and, and, and being in and around the game for most of my life. You know, I just feel like I got a pretty good grasp, not on not only just on, you know, the local Charlotte area or the Piedmont or, or whatever area that I may be local to, but, you know, really the nooks and crannies of the state, you know, from Waynesville to Wilmington or, you know, Manio to Murphy or whatever little analogy you want to use. I, I feel like I have learned a lot and, and you know, there, there's a lot of lessons I've learned along the way. You know, I've had good mentors, you know, good guys, you know, Dale and I've collaborated together. You know, there's a, a gentleman that he and I both worked with named Jim West who, who, who when it comes to a, a statistical or a historical side, you know, you, you've just learned so much and, and history does repeat itself a lot. And, and sometimes you got to, you get caught off guard with history and sometimes you still lose because there's always going to be generational talent that comes to a team, you know, maybe it's every decade or decade plus or whatever. Uh, but I just feel like, you know, when I've dedicated my life to ranking teams as I have, I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on it. All right. I got a question for you. You have all these numbers and all this data. What What's your percentage of getting it right and getting it wrong? It. Early in the season, I'm around 80, give or take. Mm -hmm. uh, I predict, you know, I don't always publish the data because I've kind of gotten out of the business of trying to say, you know, this team wins or that team sure. wins. I mean, sure. heck, we have our own Sam Griner that gets mad when I pick against <laughs> him and our observer uh, picks. Yeah. So, you know, I have just kind of gotten out of the, the feeling. I mean, call it political, call it what you – But what's what the number, want. though, Chris? Don't but I try not to tick teams off. I would say this time of year, I think last week I was like 88%. 80%. But over the year, as the year gets on and on and on, I get closer and closer and closer to a zero um, plus minus ratio to where I get most of them right. Dale, you're more of a computer model guy. Let's hear your, your take on this. Well, what Chris does is subjective. Uh, Very. And what, uh, you know, obviously a lot of stuff I've done is subjective. And uh, he mentioned Jim, you know, Jim's uh, – uh, very good at doing subjective rankings and uh, they're usually pretty good, but the more data that we can use mm -hmm. and really the way that when I was doing rankings myself weekly, yeah. uh, I was using both subjective and objective mm. data and objective data is something similar to like Massey. Yeah. Uh, Massey ratings, you know, which was used for a long time by the uh, NCAA. Um, Drew uh, Pessor, he has uh, excellent uh, objective rankings. Uh, the one of the one of the concerns people have is why is my team ranked here this mm. value and here that value? Yeah. And that's because one, you may be looking at two different subjective rankings. And of course, one person sees things one way, another person sees things another way. But then you may also be, which I'm sure a lot of people do, they go to max preps and they look and see what the rankings are there, which are 100% objective. They're just based on scores and who plays who. And the, the <laughs> good thing about the, uh, max press rankings is it uh, it can take a score 
from a team in North Carolina or a ranking in North Carolina and compare against a team in uh, California because it takes the entire uh, database and who plays who plays who. As I mentioned on Friday night uh, here in North Carolina, it, it compares from the very top team to the very bottom team based on all of their performances. So he mentioned that on our post game spaces on Twitter. If you guys aren't on our Twitter thing, yeah. 11 o'clock on Fridays, you missed some good stuff. Jim West is on there. Dale is on there. We always have grinder comes on there. We get Sam a lot comes on there. Yeah. A lot of coaches on yeah. there that right after their games and give you that, that insight, Alex, you've done a lot of rated rankings in your life too. Where do, are you more human based or more computer based or somewhere in the middle? Rankings are what they are. They exist to cultivate fan interest and discourse from day to day or week to week. Ultimately, rankings fall in the same arena of conjecture right alongside the falsity of home field or home court advantage. It's non-existent. And if anyone really wants to know how non-existent rankings ultimately are, Anyone remember that Independence High team that had already won three or four consecutive state championships? Yes. It was seated third in the state playoffs yes. one year. Yes. Uh, how did that team finish up? They won. Uh, with what kind of a record? They didn't lose. Next question. All right, but, I mean, Cam's making a good point in the back uh, about Max Preps, and I'm going to move on to rankings, but Max Preps has Providence Day 40th in the nation, but second in the state. And Raven Gap is 93rd in the nation, but first in the state. And I think that's some, what people kind of look at and get confused about, because I hear about that kind of stuff every single year. For me personally, I think the best rankings in North Carolina across any sport, what you get from the Charlotte Observer News Observer with the guru Chris Hughes, the number one voice of high school football, and then come basketball season, I got my man Rick Lewis, the number one voice of high school basketball, and then we got Alex. And these guys know the sport in and out, and I just think it needs a little bit of that human curation. Yeah. Me personally, that, that's my thought. Now it needs both. It needs yeah, both. Well, I don't. I don't necessarily. I said a little bit of that human. It's a combination of. I both. agree, and, and I do have a layer of some computerized rankings that I throw into my own rankings. Uh, you, you know, it, it helps me. I've got a few different um, weighted weighted values that kind of even things out from city to rural systems. I use JV records. You know, I try to use percentage of returning starters and some things like that. Uh, so, but, but the main thing with me is, again, the fact that I've been doing so long, I take it pretty personal. You know, coaches know that I take it personal. Uh, because I put my name on it and I want it to be right. I so I, much, that's why I spend all those hours every week. I know how much work you put into it. Let's, let's look at these rankings real quick. In the 4A, you still got Grimsley up top in Roseville. Is, is that going to be your state final? That you know, that's yet to be determined. Could it be? <laughs> yes. Uh, obviously, they've already played this year, and, and we saw a fairly significant um, differential in the points. Yes. Uh, I definitely think that Grimsley is still deserving of that number one ranking in the West. You know, are they the best team in the state? I don't know. I think those three teams right there, I think you could throw a blanket over them. I think that they're each as good as each other in different kinds of ways. Uh, that Rollsville team is surging, and if you look at them on film, and, and you don't forget just the – and this is something that I feel like you get out of my rankings, maybe that you don't get out of a computerized ranking or match preps or maybe some other entity, is the fact that look at what those players you, you can't you can't gauge the heart of the players you can't gauge the heart and the heartbeat of the program mm -hmm. you know look what that program's gone you know they had coming off a state championship appearance they had everything looking like it was going full speed ahead all of a sudden a week before the season starts the coach leaves mm -hmm. or it gets gets left I mean you know he gets dismissed from the team yep. had an interim coach last year uh that, that won 10 games and you know came on strong of late and then this year you insert a new coach and it takes a while and it also takes a toll on that program but yep. I've seen on film with that Rollsville team each and every week uh that team just gets a little bit better they execute a little bit better they've already beat a really good Butler team albeit a Butler team that was minus seven starters uh but I think coming out of the east that Rollsville team they're pretty dangerous I would watch out for that health football so, team, especially in a low-scoring game when it gets cold, when it when it's harder to pass that football, and that defense comes into play. It's gonna be pretty strong. Is so Langston? Yes. Uh, just to address that max prep, yes. it's two different rankings that you're looking at. One is computer, one is human. Okay, all right. But I'm so because max I'm preps gonna, does human rankings, and may, maybe they need to do a better job of differentiating two. I'm just telling you, they do. I, they they uh, tell you how they uh, really? derive the the rankings. Okay, but the human rankings is just a top 100 teams, mm -hmm. and it's not based on 
strength because you'll note when you look at the rankings, you'll not see anything about strength. Mm-hmm. But it, when you look at all the state rankings, you'll see strength of team. Yeah, yeah. and that's it, why. Bill so. and I used to argue all the time. We were we were frenemies, I would say, about yeah. our Sweet 16 rankings. I was like, Dale, the Sweet 16 is not a power pole. And I'm told <laughs> what I have to do to rank these teams. It wasn't like Langston's rankings. It was like, this is what you're going to do when you rank the teams. I have people above me to tell me what to do. Chris. Well, Chris, I like the by, by the way, I, I like the, the Sweet 16 the way it was and would like to see something similar uh in parallel with a power ranking because right. it does pay it, it is good to to kind of rank teams on how are you doing compared to other teams mm-hmm. within your own realm. Um uh, you know, how do how does your program look? Thus yes. you can say a Shelby is number one in the All state. Right, I, I got to keep you guys on time. We're getting heavy. So yeah. in, in, the, in yeah. the PA, Chris, is Dudley still the team to beat? You've been flip-flopping Dudley and Crest. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, Dudley is pretty pretty strong, and, and that showed last week when they beat a very, very good Rockingham County team, 49-7. to seven. Uh, Dudley's really good. Crest is really good. If Crest can ever get the defensive side of the ball ironed out, I think that they are going to be really hard to beat. And uh, you quarterback, know, they won't get that quarterback look an awful Mr. Football. That's all I can say. Yeah. Awful Mr. I don't have anything to do with it, but I'm just saying, if I did, he's looking awfully Mr. Mm-hmm. Footballish. All right, let's take a look at the 2A, Chris, uh, real quick. Uh, we got uh, Clinton and Moreau up top. Sam been saying all year long, Moreau's top two. You got him top two. They're, they're very good. Uh, the, the game I'm really looking for this week is a team that I've got just on the outside looking in in terms of the top ten, and that's Wallace Rose Hill. They've got three losses, but they're taking on a really tough East Oakland team who I think is on like a 26-game winning streak or something like that. Uh, that's the game that I've got circled in 2A this week, and that will be a good one. Is Monroe going to a state title game, Chris? I don't see anybody in Western North Carolina that's going to beat them, but you never know. Sprained ankles, drop balls, you know, that pick skin bounces weird ways sometimes <laughs> in the cold. Is anything going to stop Todd Burrow and Mount Airy from playing in a 1A state final? I think so. Uh, I, I do think that those are the top two teams. But again, I've seen Robbinsville, very, very good football team. Cutler Adams, again, all he does is score touchdowns. That's Goes both cool. ways, incredible human being, great player. That's a town with a lot of heart. But I keep saying the team that really – just, I, I don't know, something in me that says, look at this team is drawn up there in Valdez. And also another surging team that's just coming on stronger every week is Eastern Randolph. Okay. 1A is going to be hard to get through in the West. But that's the that's the biggest thing that uh, Mount Airy has to face is they're going to have competition after competition where Tarboro's going to skate to the to the finals. <laughs> Sounds like the 4A West. Promise Day and Raven Gap going to play this week. What are we going to learn, Chris? I'm going to find out a lot. You know, again, I've seen that uh, Raven Gap team, you know, defensively, they're as good as any team I've ever seen on the defensive line in high school football. And wow. I've seen more good ones over the years. They've got two or three guys, I think, with a lot of SEC offers. Um, they're, they're just really good across the board. Got a great coaching staff. Uh, with that being said, you know, Providence Day, they're they're up there as well. I mean, those are two elite of elite programs, not just public, not just private. That, that's just two football teams in the country that are best of the best. And I think it's going to be a Donnybrook on Friday. I knew when Gary Richmond asked to go see a private school football game, I knew it was big. Uh, eight man, eight man ball. Chris, what we got? No changes in the rankings this week. Uh, eight man ball, even with some wins and losses. You know, you got some of these teams that are are really exceptional at this game and some that aren't quite. Uh, Wayne Christian, again, I've highlighted them a couple times this year. I like them a lot. Uh, but the team, I don't know. There's a couple teams that are really strong. I don't know if they can make it through the gauntlet of their playoffs here in a week or two. Uh, but I really like that Faith Christian team. I think Arundel Parrott, you know, Parrott Academy has kind of been the standard bearer when it comes to eight-man ball over the years. Mm-hmm. And that Rocky Mount Academy team, all those teams are really, really good. Uh, it's going to be fun here in the next couple weeks. It's getting that time of year. You hear the guru getting ramped up. It's getting close to the playoffs. We're going to talk about the big games in Charlotte and statewide. We'll come back on the other side of this break. Meantime, everybody here and all you guys, get yourself some Deer Park. Work. Deer Park is celebrating its 150th anniversary. Deer Park, that's good water. You can taste how pure Deer Park is. Deer Park, that's good water. Deer Park, that's still good water. All right, guys, we're back. Uh, we're, we're talking about some of the big games in Charlotte. Gary, I'm going to go right to you. Is Sam going to get it done at Chambers? Or is Chambers going to do Sam? Um, they're both playing for seating. I think Huff has it pretty much locked up. Uh, they're fairly equal uh, as far as team speed, defense. Uh, 
I think West Charlotte may have an advantage in the kicking game this week. Um, it's going to be a tight one. I think the team that gets the least amount of penalties and penalty yardage mm-hmm. is going to win this game. Sam, how are you going to deal with Mr. Trey Robinson, who stepped in having a big season over there at Chambers? You run past the red, great student, just having a big year for them. Yeah, they're doing a great feeling right into the the same mold as the quarterbacks before. You know, he does a really good job running their system. Uh, Facil Blanco is the offense coordinator there, does a really good job. I think we have a great game plan going into this. We expect to win this game. This is a big game for you guys in terms of trying to get that number one seed in the, in the 3A, right? Yeah, we, we would have to win this one to have an argument to be, you know, we'd have to win out these last two games to have the argument to be the number one seed overall and come down Betty's for a road where the fish is smelling good, brother. <laughs> and there's one place you don't want to go is Cleveland County in the playoffs. <laughs> Waterloo, <laughs> the last, Waterloo the last They don't want to come down just as bad. They don't want to come down Betty's That's probably road, true. But... It's Waterloo the last three years for you in, uh, up in Cleveland County. Cam, we got a big game in Cabarrus, the Cabarrus County game of the year, Northwest Cabarrus and J.N. Robinson. Both teams unbeaten, is that right? Yep, both unbeaten, coming off absolutely dominating wins. Um, you know, this this game could come down to uh, which defense is better, honestly, because both teams are averaging a little over 40 points a game. Um, Robinson coming off a 65 to nothing win um, over South Rowan and uh, Northwest 140 something to seven, I believe, the lot in their game against uh, five and two Concord last week. So um, Alex Walker, quarterback for Northwest, is doing a lot of good things. I think this game could be really close. Um, I think Northwest takes it in a close one, like 28 to 24. Tell me about this High Point Christian Hickory Grove game. Yeah, um, you know, High Point Christian is uh, coming off their first loss of the season uh, to Asheville School, so they're going to be uh, they're going to be out for some blood. Uh, but uh, Hickory Grove's not wanting to uh, let their unbeaten record get tainted, so I think both teams uh, really need to step up on the defensive side of the ball. Both can give up points um, to some better teams. Now they have obviously some of those games on their schedule where they've won, you know, forty something to nothing, but both teams right around 40 points a game averaging. So, um, yeah, I couldn't pick a winner in this game. I think it's a coin toss. Yeah, Hickory Groves won eight straight games, which is a school record. They're trying to, you know, set a new school record now with nine. That would be some type of game. Also, Shelby's going to play East Gas, and East Gas had an absolute shootout last week with Burns. They're going to try to get another Cleveland County uh, win this week against Shelby and have a chance to potentially win a conference title. Down in Rock Hill, South Point Northwestern, the game of the year down there, it always is. Uh, both of those teams ranked in the Sweet 16. That should be a big game. And Charlotte Christian, guys, has not won a conference game. They're 0-2. They need to beat Latin to have an argument to get into the D1 playoffs. We need to watch that one. And Grice is back to talk about the game of the week, the game that Gary Richmond is going to see, a private school game. Gary Richmond, Raven yeah. Cap, in Providence Day. All right, guys, the game of the week this week, Providence Day versus Raven Gap. Normally, we don't have a team two weeks in a row, but this game was too big to miss. So let's get into it. Three keys for this game. I can't believe the first key that I had to write, but Jaden Davis has got to take care of the football. I think in that Christian game, one of those things that kept that game close early when it really probably shouldn't have been was just the interceptions. And I think, you know, now you look with Jaden having three interceptions in the past two weeks, got to make sure in these big games and, you know, in some of these games, he's not forcing the ball unnecessarily. You know, I think you're looking on that other side of that Raven Gap defense, two two DBs, uh, Patrick Williams and Walker Bryson, have seven total combined interceptions. Yes, seven total combined interceptions at this point this year. They're going to be looking to take advantage of any ill-time throws uh, or any passes made by Jaden Davis. A little bit surprising, but we know he'll get back on track. Raven Gap's hoping that he, he won't. Raven Gap must rely on their two-headed monster. So they've got two running backs, Tyrell Campbell and Anthony Quinn Jr. Tyrell with 617 yards rushing and Anthony Quinn with 421. Both of them about, you know, over 100 yards rushing this year. That two-headed monster has got to keep that uh, PD offense off the field. So they're they're averaging over that 100 yards per game. If those two guys can really get in rhythm against this tough defense and keep that offense off the field, I think it'll get Raven Gap a chance. And you know that big offensive line Raven Gap has is going to want to move people and ensure that they have that ball and can continue to turn the clock with first downs. And going back to Providence Day, I you know kind of rhyme this up. PD will be fine with Klein. Ian Klein, again, a 
great addition this year for that team. Last game, you know, when Jaden Davis was getting a little unsure, getting a little, you know, iffy with the interceptions, you could tell Providence Day really relied on Klein with 23 carries, 261 yards, and four touchdowns in that game. So if Jaden's trying to figure it out or even, you know, even having figured it out and really wanting to establish their dominance against this tough Raven Gap team, getting that ball to Ian Klein, allowing him to turn, you know, getting, you know, causing Raven Gap to place more defenders in the box, that's going to help out that passing game as well to make sure you get those one-on-one opportunities with the great receivers that we know Providence Day has. So this game will be a big-time game here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Raven Gap gets to take that trip this year. We know last year one of the probably defining moments of Jaden Davis's Mr. Football campaign was that big game against Raven Gap. I think they won by a touchdown, but he had over 400 yards passing. So as we get closer in shaping up this Mr. Football race yet again, I expect to see a defining moment from Jaden Davis, but Raven Gap's going to have something to say on the other end. Going to be a great game, and I can't wait to see it. Well, look at us going into week 10, I believe it is, of the 2023 high school football season. Looking here again at Chris's Corner, uh, talk of preps. Uh, again, you're getting down to crunch time, nitty-gritty time, whatever you want to talk about, some of these big conference battles. Uh, again, I think some of these are going to be a particular of the state playoffs and maybe even some third and fourth round games heading on to see who plays in the state title games. Uh, a couple big ones I want to highlight first. Uh, Northern Nash uh, over there at going to Bailey to take on Southern Nash. Uh, we've talked about this Northern Nash team uh, for a couple years now. Uh, we've already featured Coach uh, Andrew Ferris on as one of our uh, Deer Park Coach of the Weeks uh, earlier in the season. Uh, this Northern Nash team, again, I tell you, they're not going to go away. Uh, they're a team that I think has finally ascended onto the state level, uh, ranked up there in the top echelons of the 3A teams around the state, just a little bit behind uh, Coach Griner's West Charlotte Lions. Uh, I think this is going to be a great game. You know, one, I do give uh, Southern just a little bit of a – and edge playing at home, I wouldn't be shocked to see Southern win this game. Uh, their JVs have been phenomenal. You know, you go back and look at the playoff and the regular season games the last couple of years against Northern Nash, and they've been kind of right there on that precipice of once again taking ownership of this rivalry. Uh, but I think that's going to be a great game up there in Nash County. Uh, looking down there, I just mentioned it a few moments ago, East Duplin taking on Wallace Rose Hill. You know, this is a two-team. You talk about that Holly family, um, Battle Holly, obviously uh, – having coached at both of these programs, uh, East Oakland on a 20, I think a 23 game winning streak, uh, defending state champions. That's a game that I think could go either way. I could see uh, Coach Motzinger and that Wallace Rose Hill team knock them off, uh, even with a couple of uh, three losses they are sitting right there on the outside. Uh, let's go a little bit faster up there. The MAC championship up there you know, the, in um, Asheville, that's going to be a really big one. Again, another one of those five and three teams that played some dominant uh, top heavy teams early on in the schedule. I like that AC Reynolds team, but boy, if you look at that TC Robertson team, uh, Coach, uh, then Whitty, that team, they just seem to really jump out at you on film. That's a team I like a lot. Uh, Southern Alamance, Eastern Alamance, there's just been something in the water up there in Alamance County, you know, whether we're talking about Burlington Williams or Western Alamance, even look down the road at Tony Aguilar in Southeast Alamance, the brand new high school that's probably going to set a winch for first team, first year teams ever on varsity football this year. Uh, Alamance County year in, year out has just produced championship level programs. Burlington Cummings, they're seven and one. They're in the mix uh, for a deep round. Uh, so I really like what I see down there. Uh, Cape Fear and um, Southview, again, you know, I know a little bit about Fayetteville football, having coached over at Burt. It's been a lot of my adult life down there in the 910. Uh, like that one. And then, you know, we've, we've featured Antonio Moore, uh, Northeastern, uh, on the show a couple of years ago. He's one of the friends of the program. That Northeastern Eagle team has been on fire, averaging 60, 70 points a game the last three or four weeks. Uh, they're playing a Currituck squad, though, uh, that you better look out for. I think this Currituck team, Coach Paul Bossy, they come in there. Uh, they are a very tough, physical, physical, rugged kind of team. Uh, that's really going to be two different kinds of uh, you know, programs kind of clashing, two different styles uh, clashing on the field Friday night over there in Barco. So uh, take a look at that one. And then again, uh, you know, the past several weeks, I've been talking about the Smoky Mountain Conference, you know, whether it's Murphy, whether it's Asheville, or wh whether it's Andrews, Wayne County, who kind of roughed up uh, Murphy or Murphy last week. 
Uh, but Robbinsville, again, 7-1, and one, Cutler Adams. I've talked a lot about him this season. Uh, he, he's due all the kudos that we could talk about. What a program up there in Robbinsville. Hayesville, you know, I love talking about Hayesville. That's a program that's kind of been down in recent years, haven't quite got to press uh, that some of the other have other teams have in recent years. Uh, but anytime you get a team like that that's on a high, uh, you want to highlight them and just kind of give them a shout out and let everybody else in North Carolina know how they're doing. And for Chris's corner, that's it. But hey, I've, I've been pretty quick. I got to drink some Deer Park water. Uh, let's send it to this commercial break for Deer Park. Deer Park is celebrating its 150th anniversary. Let's take a look back. Deer Park, that's good water. You can taste how pure Deer Park is. Deer Park, that's good water. Filtered naturally beneath the earth for a crisp, refreshing taste. Deer Park. Deer Park. Deer Park. Deer Park. That's still good water. After 150 years, there's only one thing left to say. Deer Park, that's still good water. How did you all get in here? All right, guys, we're back. Uh, I want to talk to you guys about coaches pay. I know that's a, a, a topic that's always, you know, on everybody's mind. Down in Florida, the Florida uh, state coaches met with the legislators today trying to get the state association to give them a raise. They talked about how when their referees planned to strike, kind of similar to North Carolina referees, the state association stepped in and gave them a raise. They want to raise two. And the Florida Atlantic football coach, Tom Herman, said he was just flabbergasted when he saw what the pay was in Florida. And he's worried about their coaches leaving for other states. And there, that sounds so familiar to me. Just want to get your thoughts. Yeah, knowing some coaches in Florida, it really is bad. But it's bad here. And we've seen a number of coaches go across the border to South Carolina to get jobs because of pay. Uh, the problem is going to be, where does the money come from? In South Carolina, they address the money for head coaches by assigning them an AD slot. So hmm. they get that administrative pay. And, and that's, that's why they can, can always advocate for here. Yeah. So that that's why a Tommy Knott's can make 108,000 or something a hmm. year. I don't know what his current salary is, but it was 108 at one time. Uh, here in North Carolina, that's uh, that's not as easy a task to do. Uh, I think, A, I, I believe ADs are overtaxed in most uh, systems. In Charlotte-Mecklenburg, ADs, the AD jobs only half the time, mm -hmm. and it really needs to be full-time with an assistant. So, and they need to stop taxing those supplements as a bonus where they get taxed 50%. That's exactly. Another, so I, I don't know where I, – I, I truly believe they need to be paid more for the mm -hmm. hours that they work and, the, and the, yeah. what they put in, but I, we can't go to the association and ask. Maybe we can go to – now that, doing it in Florida. <laughs> now that well, now that the yeah, but our association. I mean, your your buddy, your, your buddy, your buddies watch the show. I mean, well, we could we can go to the state now since state legislature yeah. controls. So now the board of education is involved with athletics more. Maybe yeah. we can lobby the board of educations to both improve coaching pay, well, teacher pay, coaching pay, and let's improve the athletic directors. Uh, roles in schools right. and make them full-time ADs. It, I would not mind of some type of penny tax in, in Mecklenburg County and in Wake County to, to try to boost the, the coaches' salaries. Alex, your, your thoughts on what you see here, the average supplements being what they are in Charlotte, I think they're like 6,000. I think it's the same in Raleigh, but in Charlotte, at least they're taxed, and so you only get half of that. Um, and these guys work year round. It's a 12-month job. Uh, it's it's all day long, all night long. You're dealing with parents. I mean, what, what are your thoughts here? Well, first and foremost, in full disclosure, everybody knows that I'm a school administrator and an athletics administrator. So there's full disclosure there. Full disclosure, too, that independent of whether we're lobbying to a state association or whether we're lobbying to individual LEAs, local education agencies, or lobbying to whomever, there is no formula whatsoever that will create circumstances by which athletics directors and or coaches in any sport are paid anywhere close to fairly for what they do. So let's just put that out there as well. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is 
I'm a little confused as to what's happening here in Florida because it is not and it cannot be the responsibility or the role of a state athletics governing body to determine compensation wages, whether we're talking salary, whether we're talking supplements, whatever. That cannot happen. That is within the jurisdiction or the purview of each LEA, local education. That goes, back, that goes back to Dell's point, the lobby of the Board of Education. Yeah. It, it, it is. It, it, it cannot happen that way because you're dealing with okay, but local- Alex, how, how can you how can you give coaches more money? Just real quick. We gotta we gotta let get these other guys on, but just on real par quick, with other can, states. Yeah, how, how can how can North Carolina pay its coaches more money? North Carolina can pay its coaches more money by working in conjunction with whether it be the state legislature or the state board of education or whomever to create a professional development paradigm by which <clears throat> professional or educators uh, advanced credential pursuits, whether it's a degree, whether it's a certain certification, whether it's a uh, a certified athletic administrator, a certified master athletic administrator through the National Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association or whatever may have you carries with it a state mandate or a state guarantee that that credentialing supported by uh, professional development dollars at the LEA level eventually will lead to an automatic state induced bump for those credentials. That's one way to start the process. It encourages professional development, which ultimately is better uh, for our our students and uh, educators professionally. And then it's an active step that the state and LEAs themselves can take to retain highly qualified professional educators within education-based athletics. We're just at a point now where No one ever did it for money. It's not about money from that regard, but it's to the point where too many people are looking at the input being required for four or five thousand dollars. And even that four or five thousand dollars is not worth the required input. No, I I, I hear you on that. Uh, Cam, give you the final word here. Yeah, I'll keep it short and sweet. I think coaches for what they do should definitely be compensated more. Um, yeah, I think like you mentioned, it's it's a it's a year round job. I mean, they don't they don't just hold the coaching position from August to December. They it's it's year round, and so to get that little bit of money for what is truly a year round job, it just it just isn't cutting it anymore. Absolutely. All right, guys, it's time to lock the doors. We're gonna bring in the guys. It's time for Coach versus Coach. Welcome to another edition of. All right, Gary, take it over for Coach Grice tonight here at Coach versus Coach. Uh, I was talking to Coach Grinder before the game. Normally, you know, he likes to get on defense first. That's just his mentality. But he thought he you needed all the help you could get tonight, so he's going to let you take the ball first and roll with it. Uh, so here we go. First question, Coach versus Coach. Uh, can North Carolina school systems, the NCHSAA, or lawmaker, what can they do or lawmakers to boost coaches' pay? I know we just talked about it, and what should they do? Uh, maybe they should create a pool of money. Uh, I, I think one way to even it out a little bit is to pay coaches for making the playoffs and for going deeper uh, in the playoffs on a weekly basis. Say, for example, for each week that uh, you extend your season, that's another six or seven hundred dollars uh, per staff. As, I mean, each person on the staff, not just the head coach, because the head coach is not doing it by himself. Um, I think that would be an equitable way to uh, to achieve fairness is to play the guy, pay the guys for the playoffs because you're still working those long hours and um, you should be compensated for it. I'm saying basically if you raise the dollar, like raise it a dollar for maybe compensation for the state playoff games, that dollar can go to a pool that paid coaches, what Gary was saying. Um, I think years of service matter as well. It'll keep people 
from leaving the state, I think. Um, you start getting someone who's been successful for 12 years and they've been winning for four or five years in a row, that South Carolina door opens up, that Georgia door opens up. Um, if their family's not regulated kind of in North Carolina as well in the teaching career, it's easy for those coaches to leave. That's why you see the Aaron Brands of the world and other ones leave before they actually are grandfathered in with um, – you know, retirement in North Carolina. That's what we'd love to see. We'd love to see these North Carolina coaches and teachers retire in North Carolina before they leave, but that's not happening right now. Both of you make excellent points. I agree with you. Uh, let's move on here to question number two. Uh, Coach Grounder, we're going to stick with you. Uh, the playoffs are coming. People are grumbling about RPI ratings once again. How should we see the playoffs? Um, I think – I don't know exactly if they've changed it. I see the strength of schedule – in the max preps rankings, but I don't know if that factors in anymore. I think that it's just still based upon your winning percentage, your opponent's winning percentage, and your opponent's opponent's winning percentage. Um, I think strength of schedule, that one little factor, if they could calculate that in there as well, I think that would be fantastic. It would definitely help us out um, going against the juggernauts of the world. I feel like we might have you know, at least a top three schedule in the state, no doubt about it. Um, what I would add to what Sam is saying is, number one seeds, of course, uh, are, are automatic bids. Uh, number two seeds should um, be automatic based on, number two from each conference, rather, should be automatic as long as they have a winning record. Okay, and then everything else in, in a classification should be, whether it's in the West or East, should be wild card stats. And so you might have a tough conference like we have here in Charlotte, like the one Sam is in. You might get five teams to make the playoffs, but they're truly deserving because of the, the schedule they play. Um, I think that's the fair way to do it uh, than putting teams in the playoffs that, you know, have a, a, a three and seven record just because they play at a weak conference and they, they got the number three seed because it was automatic. Okay, question number three. Gary, we're going to stick with you right here. Um, how big of an issue is vaping in high school athletics? I know both of you have been coaches and teachers for an awful long time, so I know you've both seen this. And what should be done about it? Uh, it's very big. Um, one thing I, I, I was telling somebody, you know, I'm, I'm doing a, a long-term sub position in a high school now. One thing you don't and, – and my classroom is right across the hall from the bathroom. And we know 20 years ago – you smell cigarette smoke. Well, <laughs> kid, kids don't smoke cigarettes anymore. They vape. So it's harder to detect. Uh, when they ask to go to the restroom, you don't worry about them going to smoke cigarettes. You know, they still smoke weed, but um, usually they, they vape those that participate. And it's a big problem. It's a big problem. Yeah, this is a huge problem. Um like you said, it's it's getting harder and harder to you know detect these issues, and there's different counties that have different rules. I know there's certain counties like Cabarrus County, if if someone is vaped, they're caught vaping with a like a uh, it's called like a fried or a weed pen or something of that nature, then they're off the that team for good. Um, other schools, you know, you can get ten days, all these different things. The problem is just it's so convenient, it's so easy for these kids to do it that there is no smell, there is no way to. I mean, they can literally walk down the hallway, hit a hit a vape pen or a nick, they call them, and then all of a sudden that little fog goes away and it's just so convenient and they're more addicted than cigarettes. Yes. So it's a, it's a huge problem. The addiction, once they do do it, it's even a stronger problem. They see these people with the hookah lounges, they think it's like a, a status quo. So the closest thing to a hookah would be like a vape pen. And so once you get that addiction going, it's a huge problem. Huge. I agree. And I'm going to throw it out there on the parents and education for parents as well. You know, I know parents and, you know, I grew up in the era where people were smoking in the bathroom. Not, you know, that was prevalent everywhere. The parents who say they would never let their kids smoke, but yet those same parents I see going into the store and buying the bait for the kid because they don't think it's that big a deal. So, I mean, it's a parent deal too. Hey, you got to remember when I was in school, they had smoking areas. Outside yes, the cafeteria, right? Me too. Um, Dale, Dale, you're just telling your age, brother. I am. <laughs> but uh, I, I am too, Dale. I remember students who used to go smoke with their teachers. 
Yeah, exactly. So, I, you know, I don't know. We've had it in the culture so long that this has been accepted and actually provided for locations for it to be done that, I, you know, I don't know how you manage this. It needs to be managed, but how do you manage something that's such a big problem? If you, if Sam, if you kick a player off the team, if he's called vaping or she's called vaping, we wouldn't have very many teams, would we? I mean, is that the right way to do it? Like the one and done? Um, I'm I'm always a big Bobby Bowden type guy. To hurt the player, not the team. Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's levels to it. Like I said, you can't be just black and white in a rule book. You have to evaluate every situation. How can you grow and get better from it? So I don't think suspending someone – for the entire season, unless there's multiple too, like there's multiple fractions that mm-hmm. we're not learning from fractions before. So I'm all about growth. Um, I'm all about mercy, but there has to be learning involved going into those type of deals. And that's the key. You know, if someone's done something multiple Gary, times, I'll get rid of them. Gary, you're a classroom teacher. I'm just wondering, is there more education and parents need to have? Cause I was not aware until like the last week or two, how big a deal this was. Um, is there something that maybe we can help educate the parents so they can get, especially for the younger parents of younger children, to kind of get them aware of what's going on. I, I really don't know how you can communicate with the parents. I mean, you can send them emails and a, a program to look at, but you know, it's just like when you have open house in October and you have right, three or four kids show up, three or yeah. four parents show up yeah. for classroom of 30. So, you know, the the, the parents, as, as long as their kids not getting in trouble and making good grades, I think, you know, they, they can't fix it all. And the school system definitely can't fix it all. we yeah, got man. enough problems to deal with. Then, mm-hmm. go, you know, unless we actually catch them vaping, that's yeah. not something we're looking, you know, looking to do. So how many of your parents actually don't know that their kids are vaping? I would bet yes, you that number is real small, right? I don't I don't know. I think in, in what I've seen, I think this transcends, you know, race, ec- economic status. You, you know, I've seen kids from – you know, all walks of life doing this. I think this is across the board, everybody. I think that it is very widespread. And, you know, it doesn't matter what walk of life or what part of the school or where you're at. I think that the parents are either oblivious to it or they know. It's one of the two. I, I was oblivious. I had no idea. Cam, you're, a young, Cam, you're a young guy. How bad is it, Cam? I mean, when I was in high school, it was becoming more and more popular, the whole vaping thing. Um, I can only imagine how bad it is now. I mean, I know my brother's in high school and he, I mean, he'll tell you, I mean, he walk around with these little elf bars every, everywhere, just walking in the hallways. I mean, I mean, they're so small, you can conceal them easily. So, yeah, it's, it's, and it's a bad problem. And don't they put, like, the THC in it so they're actually, like, getting high on campus, can. right? Uh, some of them, yeah. I mean, you have, to, you have to modify them to do that, but, yeah. Speaking speaking of, you know, getting high, they also use those gummies, you know. They, yeah. they use those gummies and, and vaping and... You know, I remember, say, 15, 20 years ago, teachers that smoked would, would go out to the faculty parking lot during the yeah. planning period, sit yeah. in their car and, and take a puff. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if you have teachers that are vaping on campus. So, you know, Gary, period, I'm sorry. No, are so they no, do- more, no more nickel and dime bags now. It's just gummies. and, and Well, are the dummies THC or are they CDB? I don't have the no, CDB's not CDB. There's one that it's doesn't CBD, have like an yeah. effect on you, like, like uh, the high effect, and there's one that can. Uh, so THC is is illegal. CDB is not. Um, well, I don't think there's going to be too many places where we's illegal in about five more years. Well, I, I there, there's actually THC gummies that are sold over the counter that are illegal, I, but well, they can only be they can only be sold. They, they can't be sold Chris, everywhere. Chris, I, I am so oblivious to this. I, I mean, I'm because, glad I was educated because I, I, mean, well, I, I think there are a lot of parents out there like me that have no clue, and not to say oh, hopefully my kids aren't doing it, but have no clue. The little you know, I. Again, I'm not going to judge different. someone where they do it or they don't do it. The only hard and fact thing that I'll say is I don't want to see bus drivers doing it. That's like where I'm going to draw the line because they're well, hauling kids. Well, we they, can't get bus drivers. That's a man. When I was a kid, the kids used to drive the bus. They did. They, they sure did. did. Exactly. Cool. All right, Sam, it's time to put you in your one shot. What's your final thought? I know you're scared of death the chambers on Friday because they're going to have you in. The, they're going to have you in the video. Don't talk about them. They're going to have you in the video. Ah. Man, it's a long time between here and Friday. I got a lot of work to do before I feel confident about that. Um, but I can tell you where I'm not confident at on my last words is the Carolina Panthers. And uh, it's sad to say that 
we are going to be looking at some of these managerial decisions that we have made from the head coach, maybe decision from moving up in the draft because we could have done this exactly what we did, got more linemen, whatever, be having the same type of season, and we'd be targeting to get the number one quarterback, Caleb Williams, if he came out. Hopefully, if he would have came out, um, we would have been getting him without losing all the picks. So it's going to come down as something really crazy. We're going to look back at this. Carolina Panthers give away the number one pick overall to the Chicago Bears at the end they of the year. They keep getting pounded. Yeah. Uh, that's uh that that would be that'd be really hard to take. Well, it was another great episode of Talking Press. We'll be back again next week for week eleven of the season. Uh, each week we get close to the playoffs, and once we hit the playoffs, you guys got to make sure you tune in because we're gonna really turn the guru loose when we get to the playoffs. That's the grinded the West Charlotte football coach who stayed out of trouble this week. I was surprised. I thought Chambers Week might get you get you going, get you one of those slow motion videos, but it didn't work well, out. I'm, that I'm way. gonna be hype. I'm gonna be hype come Friday. <laughs> Gary Richmond is DMS coach. Chris Q's the number one voice high school football. Cameron to get the guru in training. Dale Ross in the story. I'm Langston, and we are Talking Preps. And I'm picking Chambers. <laughs>